Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go over Twitter, look at some information. I'm gonna give you some of my financial opinions along with maybe some explanations of what's going on uh, in some of these markets. And I'm gonna give you my opinions there. If you need any help with anything, definitely check out finding-value.com, the platinum membership. Uh, we've got question and answer sessions. We've got one coming up this Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, if you want to. And there's a lot of different information on that website. There's some training sessions as well uh, for technical analysis, chart reading. So let's dive in here. Uh, I'll give you my opinions here. It's at finding underscore finance. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's how you, you find me. So um, we talked about natural gas, and this is EU, European Union Natural Gas Inventories in percent of full. Uh, EU is at 63.43%, Germany at 71%, Italy at 63%, France at 48, and the Netherlands at 64. The reason natural gas is tanking is because we didn't get drawdowns in this natural gas. It's been very warm, and the natural gas levels are at very high levels in relationship to history. Now, <clears throat> the problem is, is if they go to fill this back up and we're, we didn't really draw down very much, we could have a problem with liquefied natural gas prices dropping very low if it's very easy to fill back up. If the weather remains warm, this won't draw down enough in its inventory to accept more natural gas when it comes back up. So you can see in 2022, it started from a very low level natural gas, and they brought it all the way back up using ridiculously high prices paired with uh, partial closures of industry. But if we start from a very high level, we won't need to bring those levels as high again, and we, I don't think we need the pricing as high to fill it back up. So that's that's why everyone's kind of selling off natural gas is because the inventories are not drawing down over in Europe. And there could be a glut, so to speak, in natural gas. We already went over that one. Uh, this is mentions of recession on earnings calls entering a recession. And this is the proportion of Russell 3000 firms mentioning recession during quarterly earnings calls, and it's down all the way down to 12%. Uh, it was up uh, very high in 2022. Uh, actually, it was the highest uh, it's been since 2010. So uh, that's go come on down. I thought that was an interesting thing there. Uh, we've got uh, one of three. So what creates a market crunch? Always a lack of reserves. True in 2008. True in 1929. True in 1826 New York. And what that means is a market crunch, uh, they're talking about bank reserves. Bank reserves going into a crunch. So if we were to look at this, it says, I'm trying to see where to start, but in the present instance, the contraction of the currency has been aggravated by the peculiar slender means with which a great part of the private banking establishments in England have been conducted. Wow, what a crappy sentence that is. <laughs> the issues of, of many of these banks had been enormously extended without any adequate reserve of available funds to meet such sudden demands as it is of a very essence of the principles of banking to contemplate, blah, 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 blah. What, what this basically means is a banking crunch can happen when the reserves get drawn down, you have a bunch of loans out there and the loans go bad and people start to fear and when you don't have adequate reserves, you get a run on the bank. But usually that happens with the destruction of credit. They tried to say that here in a sentence that's just absolutely retarded. No offense to retardedness, but it, it was a very bad sentence structure there and a bunch of jargon threw, thrown in there. I couldn't even read that book, guys. It's so written so poorly. Um. Debt backs, okay, so this this one I really want to touch on. I, I really want to touch on this. I'm even going to do a diagram, I think. It says, debt backs fiat currency. Debt is the promise to do work in the future. Work is the expenditure of 
energy. As long as future price of energy is as cheap or cheaper in fiat terms, the system works. Peak cheap energy breaks the system as debt cannot hold value against energy. There's So I, I want to look backwards and show you guys something real quick, all right? So this is uh, a line. Call this uh, GDP, right? And what I'm going to do, that's the black line here. That's GDP. I'm going to draw another line. I'll draw it in red. And this is uh, the line of, of paper currencies. So what we want to see is we want to see this kind of do like this. We want it to be around uh, GDP and the, and the currency want to be kind of tied together. What this will ultimately do is tie inflation. Um, it's kind of hold inflation to a certain point. Uh, or what you do is you, you grow slightly more than, than this. Uh, and that's kind of like a 2% inflation rate. That's the difference between the red line and the black line is 2% right? That is a more balanced market. What happens in these systems is that a demographic that's larger comes into home buying years. What it does is it pushes this upward like this, and you get this gap between where the money supply is and where GDP is. That gap is your inflation. And that gap can grow. What if that's 10% when this little gap is 2%? And what happens is Eventually, GDP will eventually respond and turn higher, and while this guy turns back lower, and you get some sort of, you know, meeting in the middle type move, where they they kind of go back and forth, and then you get a recession where this kind of comes back or whatever. So that's what happens with these recessions and the inflation and and all that stuff. If this goes back down the red line, that is deflation, and you get a deleveraging event. That's a deleveraging event there which ultimately will result in a recession. And it usually has a time lag of like maybe 18 months or 24 months, something like that. So, so that's what happens. Now, what happens is this whole system that I just described here, the way this thing works is we need GDP to go up like it's going, right? But what happens if your money supply even if it stays flat, let's call this, um, this is your M2 money supply, the black line, all right? So the black line is M2 money supply. It's going up like this steady, just for this example. What happens if, I'll do it in green. What if your GDP, you know, your, your GDP is a response to M2 money supply. So the M2 money supply grows and your GDP grows. What if you hit a constraint in energy and your GDP does that? What happens then is if the design of the system of M2 wants to grow like this because it has to grow, or even worse, it grows exponentially like that, which our money M2 money supply was doing that. We're getting a little bit of a turnover in the short term. If you can't grow your GDP, which is the green line, this is GDP. The green line's GDP. So if you if you can't grow this, your inflation that that is caused here if if um we'll we'll choose another color blue is inflation here this gap here that grows that's inflation that's 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 m2 money supply chasing fewer goods and services in the system as your m2 money supply grows you get this gap now what i'm talking about here is if you get that in energy the entire system of energy is a function of, of, of a conversion. <clears throat> so let, let me try to um, explain all this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of go way out on this side, all right? So let's go file new. So file new, don't save. So let's say you've got um, GDP here. So GDP, and, and this is like your number here. What what basically GDP is, it's a function of energy. I can't, it's hard to write like this. It's energy plus other basic commodities, all right? So it's other commodities here. If this goes lean, your GDP will go lean. So GDP equals energy plus other commodities. And if you go 
and you have a, a shortage of energy and you go to you try and you try to raise your GDP, you have a problem if you've got a problem in energy. Energy, everything in, in society is a derivative of energy. And if energy goes short, you're going to have a problem with GDP. If you have a problem with GDP, you're going to have a problem with inflation because the, the design of the system is, is a debt-backed fiat currency. And a, a currency is a promise to buy something in the future. But GDP is energy plus commodities. That is a, a final product or work. So when, when we look at this, and, and hopefully this, this makes sense, guys. I know this is kind of crazy here, but if, if you can't do anything, so let's just say here's society, right? So there's society. It's all here. Society, more or less, what they want is they want these products over here. But in order to make a product, you need energy plus a commodity equals a product. If you're short energy and the, and the price of energy goes way up, it means that your product pricing is going to go up. And that is, by definition, inflation. And what that means in like a big long-term scale of things, the products that you own and the embedded energy it took to build that product. So if the product took more energy to build it and or more commodities, then the product value will go up in a high energy uh, intense environment. That's why real assets go up in this type of environment. But what if you have energy shortage and you have commodity shortages? It means your product pricing, especially those with large commodities and embedded ener energy in it, will go up substantially. Does that make sense? So what I'm trying to say is the more energy it takes to build a certain product and the more commodities that are embedded in that product are going to go up even further to the upside if you have problems with energy which means the, the more embedded energy in it, the harder it's going to be to replace and the more expensive it's going to be to, re, to, to replace. And we make it to a, a point where the cost of things don't even matter. It's the energy it takes to build it. That's where the value is going to be because you can't replicate it in a energy scarce environment. So if something has high utility or high value in society and it takes a lot of energy to build, that's what's going to be valuable in, in an environment with um, energy prices. Peak cheap, peak cheap energy breaks the system as debt cannot hold value against energy. I, I completely agree. And the things of value will be those that take the most energy and commodities to build. Here is um, Mark Zandi. He says, the economy has better than even odds of avoiding a recession in the coming months. But what's dead ahead will be a financial struggle especially for low and low middle income Americans. This is clear from the surge in consumer borrowing and delinquency rates over the past year. Now, we're not seeing a huge move in mortgage delinquency rates. Uh, that's still really low, but we can see auto is pretty high and consumer finance and bank card. Those are the big ones. And I don't know, you know, mortgage rates are locked in, but it still gets harder to service it if everything else gets harder to service as well. We've got uh, with Freeport LNG about to add 2.4 billion cubic feet per day or 2% to U.S. demand and gas rigs falling the most since 2020 last week. The bottom for gas could be right around the corner. So this is for natural gas. Um, we can see here that we've got oil and then we've got gas going down lower here. And that's the weekly increase in oil and gas rigs, just to kind of show you guys what it's doing. And you can see. We were positive all over here in 2022s, but it's going negative for gas here in, in August onward for 2022. And we're starting to dip lower for gas. So rigs are getting pulled off uh, for those that are drilling for natural gas. And, and that's gonna they're gonna find a balance in the system. That's how you find that balance. Uh, here's I, uh, IEA's uh, viral warns of tighter ener energy supply next winter. I talked about this before saying that we could swing from a, a glut to a squeeze even in a year or two. 
And th- this is more evidence saying, hey, IEA, Byron warns of tighter energy supply next winter. And he, he's warned of possible energy shortages next winter as relatively little new liquefied natural gas is coming online. So in terms of terminals. And and actually, let's let's dive in here real quick. I think he said that um, he's warned of possible energy shortages next winter as relatively little new liquefied natural gas is coming to the market while China's consumption is set to rise this year. European governments made many correct decisions over the last year to ensure energy supply, such as building more LNG terminals to replace pipeline deliveries of Russian gas, Viral told. It says, but they also got lucky, he said, with a mild winter dampening demand while economic weakness in China led to the first drop in consumption there for 40 years. It says, for this winter, it is right to say that we are off the hook. If there are no last-minute surprises, we should get through. Maybe with some bruises here and there, said Viral. But the question is, what happens next winter? An additional 23 billion billion cubic meters of LNG is expected this year, uh, adding to even with only a small increase in economic output as pandemic restrictions ease. China would likely swallow 80% of the extra gas. So we could still be very tight coming up next winter. And we could be, with with the drilling rigs pulling back on natural gas, we could come into a market balance pretty quick and reverse this thing. Um, another thing to think about natural gas is the the chart pattern that is being created matches the beginning of the last bull market in the in the early 2000s and the chart pattern that that created as well. So from a human uh, herd mentality psychological standpoint in the technical analysis, these guys match up and we very well could see a big move in natural gas over time. It says investing is much more of a waiting game than people realize. I agree with that. It says got the spot uh, breakout back test going on. So macro nowadays has too many parameters for anyone to get it consistently right based on that alone. We've nailed all the major lows and highs of the service for the sector since March 2020. So this is U.UN, the spot. We can see it's breaking out to the upside. We've got some back tests going on, but I think we're on the pre- hopefully we're on the precipice of a big move. Hopefully that's the case. Uh, and, I, and I do think that is uh, and, and very well could be. And this could be a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven always has this hump. And then we break. It could be uh, a Jesse Livermore accumulation c- uh, cylinder. Uh, it says mortgage rates are back up. As long as housing affordability remains pressurized like this, it'll be hard to sustain a recovery in home sales. And I do agree we're at levels of affordability that is impacting uh, sales. That is for sure. Um, This is Peter Lynch about the biggest investment mistake and Warren Buffett calling him in 1989 about one of his quotes that he had. He says, why peak oil demand is a a canard? In my opinion, oil demand is a function of price. Lower oil prices relative to Western financial asset prices and oil demand will rise. Give other nations the ability to buy oil in their own currency, like the U.S., and their oil demand will rise. I don't think oil demand is a function of price. I disagree with that statement, but I I agree that other nations, if you give them the ability to basically print their own currency to buy oil, that will increase uh, demand. Price, we've seen oil uh, demand go up when price goes up simultaneously. So I, I don't think it's an inverse function, like he said. But um, I do think I, I do like this quote down here. It says housing is now the least affordable since 1980. And there we are in, in the 80s. And we're all the way down here in terms of affordability. Um, that also somewhat, you know, I'll, I'll say it, it somewhat means that we are in a very tight housing market. And what I mean by tight, it means that there's a lot of demand for homes. And, and if you can't have it be otherwise, uh, you can't have the market be uh, completely filled with homes and inventory and have poor affordability. So affordability is a function of how tight the market is and how many potential buyers there are uh, out there. It says Atlanta Fed GDP now real quarter one GDP up to 2.4 percent versus 0.7 percent earlier this year. The strongest recession in history continues. 
And I just thought that was funny because everyone's calling for recession, but yet GDP is up 2.4% versus the 0.7% earlier. Uh, this is Tracy. It says it's build season for crude oil in U.S. Uh, right now with refinery maintenance underway. Also, almost 2 million barrels per day of capacity went into early maintenance after Storm Elliott. Leaving out mentioning the ridiculous adjustment factor that I believe the monthly report will show to be inflated. It says this is the build people are freaking out about. So this is weekly stocks, and this is the little build in the circle there that, that they're talking about for oil. Now, keep in mind, though, <clears throat> we decimated our SPR to keep the, the, the weekly stocks at this level where it's at. We decimated it. So this came at great cost to keep inventories where they're at. And this is where people, you know, we, we usually build at some point, and we haven't had a build since 2020. We've just been going down the whole time. So we'll see what happens uh, in oil. Looking at, uh, it says consumers are becoming less and less delinquent on balances. This runs counter to the consumer is in trouble mantra we keep hearing about all the time. If the consumer is 70% of GDP, this is another clue a recession isn't the likely scenario in 2023. So what this is, is this is um, delinquencies on balances. So this is severely... Uh, derogatory 120 plus 90 days late 60 days and 30 days and you can see we're at a very low level for quarter this is quarter one here so quarter three or four of 2022 we're very low level and this is percent of balance 90 plus days delinquent by loan type and you can see that it, a lot of these have been declining uh, over time it looks like auto loans is up and same with credit card depending on the time frame that you're choosing to look at this stuff by. <clears throat> this one is GDX, the senior gold miners ETF, bullish falling wedge. And that's that bullish falling wedge from Silver Chartist uh, on the right hand side where we could potentially break to the upside. Um, gold and silver are also echoing that they could go higher in the short term on a bounce. We've got uh, this is palladium. It says it's a pretty large bullish blue falling wedge. It's very probable that this is a false breakout in the making. Where we have a falling wedge, you break to the downside, create a false breakout. I call it the slingshot cheetah. And then we slingshot higher uh, to higher levels. Bullish palladium is also bullish platinum, in my opinion. It says here what I tell people when they ask if I think CPI inflation is manipulated lower. CPI is accurate if... You never upgrade anything technological and use the same car and TV and phone that you did in the 80s or 90s. You forever rent. You don't account for anything getting worse over time. Example, airplane seats getting smaller or more cramped, planned obsolescence, nutritional value of food getting worse due to industrial agriculture, the free range organic eggs that everyone used to eat at four times the price. Uh, the BLS adjusts CPI lower for positive quality improvements, but not for negative quality movements. You don't mind the lags it has to it has to the real world, some of which can take a full year to catch up, like shelter. So in conclusion, CPI is an accurate measurement. It says you just have to understand what it's actually measuring. It's the cost of a living for a life that never gets better and automatically substitutes the lowest quality product available at all times. It's essentially the lowest possible inflation rate a person could have with all the substitutions and a hedonic adjustments that they can do to manipulate the CPI uh, lower. Um, yeah, I'll skip this one here. It says, when, when stocks are attractive, you buy them. Sure, they can go lower. I've bought stocks at 12 that went to two, but then they went to 30. So I also thought that was kind of cool there. Now, that's, that's what I've got for today, guys. That's kind of where I'll end it. Uh, a lot of good information there. Uh, on a lot of stuff. And uh, again, guys, I mean, you can get conflicting information too. I mean, I can find stuff where people are are looking at delinquency rates of whatever, and I get two different data sets, which is right. I go, I tend to go with the Fred, the, the Fred stuff and they're saying delinquency rates are lower. So that that's what I'm going off of. But um, yeah, sometimes things can conflict. I, I think we had one thing that conflicted on here. 
in terms of some of the delinquency rates. And it can also conflict using different time frames. You can use a longer time frame, say like, hey, look, you know, every five years this has gone up with some movements in between. If you take a shorter time frame, like a one year time frame, you can see things that come back down. Who's right? Who's going to who's going to nail the long term? I always go with longer term stuff. Uh, if you can wait it out and you've got a higher probability on a longer time frame, I'll take the higher probability and just play the big long term trend. Uh, but that's what I've got for today, guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.